Welcome to A10 Alliance. I'm your host, Gunter Rice, Vice President of Marketing with A10 Networks and Mobile Industry Veteran. Our guest today is Tim Crawford, Business Development Leader and Advisor to CIOs Globally and host of CXO In The Know podcast. In this episode, we talk about the challenges and opportunities CIOs are facing today with the global pandemic, how digital transformation really needs to be about business transformation, and why the new normal for IT will never be what it was before COVID-19. Hey, Tim, welcome to the program at A10 TV. How are you? I'm well. It's great to uh, be on the program and great to chat with you yet again. Yet again, that's so true. Well, um, you know, there is a hot topic. And I, since you are an advisor to a plethora of CIOs today and the COVID-19 pandemic continuing out there, you know, I, it's obvious that a lot of CIOs right now must be struggling with the work from home environment and the digital transformation they have been going through. What's, what do you hear out there? right now what are they what are the pain points and what is really going on with the digital transformation well there's a lot to unpack there and so maybe let's talk about digital transformation and business transformation first and where covid-19 and and the coronavirus uh, crisis has kind of started to shift that so you know digital transformation is something that businesses were really trying to get their arms around and figure out how they kind of navigate through that at the end of the day, though, the problem is digital transformation was somewhat dead on arrival. And the reason why is because it lacked that business context. And so organizations that were early to go down this path learned the hard way that they spent millions of dollars in digital transformation and really had nothing to show for it from a business impact standpoint. Um, so what we're seeing now is companies are kind of pulling back and saying, okay, hold on a sec. Let's think about this more meet from a more meaningful perspective. And what that means is let's focus on business transformation rather than digital transformation. Business transformation is really what we need to be doing. It's how we should be thinking. It becomes the foundation and context for the decisions that we make. When you start to create a conversation around business transformation, then your decisions around digital start to become clear and you can tie them directly back to those particular business aspects. What COVID-19 and the coronavirus crisis has done for us is it's just accelerated that process. No longer can you kick that digital transformation can down the road. You have to focus on business transformation. You have to find new ways to engage with your customers. And it's changed the way we operate our businesses, right? We're all doing this from home today. Um, it's also changed the way that we engage with our customers because our customers are no longer able to come into our storefronts, come into our businesses. We're not able to engage face-to-face. -face. And so we have to think very differently about how companies are engaging with us. And these have all kind of shifted pretty considerably just in the last 120 days. Interesting. So, <clears throat> so what you said uh, when it comes to particularly the business transformation and the digital transformation being combined here and inter interlined. Um, does, that, does that mean that uh, more CIOs are now considering to even accelerate moving the applications into the cloud or jumping to, you know, moving over to SaaS type of models? Do you see that? Well, so there are a couple things that, that I have to unpack there a little bit to provide some context. Number one is, when you look at digital transformation, you have to shift those gears to business transformation because that becomes your directional component for the digital transformation. When you start to look at things from a business standpoint, then you start to understand which tools make the most sense and how you use those tools. So it becomes less of a conversation around, should I use private cloud? Should I use public cloud? Should I use SaaS? Should I be doing this on-prem in my corporate data center? Should I be doing it at the edge? It's really more about the experience and where you want to put your investments to address those direct business uh, aspects that are front and center. I will say though, on the whole, it has really advanced the thinking around cloud. And what I mean by that is that 120 days or so ago, 
people were still holding back with cloud. They're still going, well, I'm not so sure if this is the right way to go, or they're all in and they're not thinking through how they're doing it. I mean, you saw these extremes, these wild extremes. And now what's happening is people are saying, look, all of those hurdles that we had in the past, they're gone. They immediately have been removed. We have to figure out how to be smarter about how we use resources. And what that means is we're using a combination of different resources in different ways. But let's also keep in, keep in mind that companies are having to face immediate issues, not just around the virus crisis, but we are also facing an economic crisis. Mm -hmm. And so there are some short-term objectives that have to be met where companies are pulling back on spend pretty demonstrably. And then at the same time, we have to think about that long-term game. So there is this kind of tug and pull that is happening right now. And of course, cloud and automation play a role in that. To, to your point about IT spend as well, I want to quote here someone, uh, Gartner analyst Paul Proctor said apparently that a lot of organizations are just concerned about survival at this point. And, uh, and he's also saying, it is, you know, you have to be basically flexible where your workforce is now either at home or on-prem. But what it also means is the IT cost goes up because, of course, IT is not just anymore focused on, um, you know, the workforce being obviously on-prem, but now all the way distributed. What's, what's, your, what's your view? What do you hear from the CIOs? Are they dealing with that, with oh. that struggle? Absolutely, in spades. Um, let's face it, you know, sending an entire workforce home and doing that at scale is a monumental task. And companies are still having to kind of figure out how to do that effectively. You may think, okay, let's just give someone a laptop and they've got high speed internet at home, so they should be good to go, right? Yeah. Wrong. Because here are the issues. Number one, you've now extended your cybersecurity footprint out to a number of different networks that you don't manage, you don't have access to. You also might be giving them a piece of equipment that is not part of your standard build. And so you have this combination of, I've got new equipment that is somewhat uh, unfamiliar to me that doesn't have a standard build on it. I also have networks that I'm riding on that are not secured networks. And so now I have to consider, okay, where does VPN come in? And the other issue is, you now have to start supporting those home networks. And this was a real challenge right out of the gate because not, it's not as simple as I'm at home working remotely as I might have done here and there, but now it's myself, my wife, who's also an executive, my two teenage kids who are doing school remotely via video conferencing. Now we're completely taxing our home network in ways we never have in the past. And so that on top of everything else has created a monumental challenge for the IT organization that we are just now starting to get our arms around. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, you're absolutely right. And that, um, <clears throat> you know, when you talk about, uh, you know, having a, a family type of environment at home and you, uh, you try to do, obviously try to be productive as you would be in an office environment, it's, it's, you know, you hear the, bar, the, the barking dog here and there, you deal with a new environment. But I think we are, we are getting used to it, although we hear over and over the new, the new buzzword is Zoom fatigue or Webex fatigue and so on. So what's your view on this? Because we have been using Zoom even on Webex for the last years. But now it's almost like a necessity because we don't have these physical meetings any longer. And we might not have that actually for the next six to 12 months. So That's right. how, how are IT organizations uh, dealing with that? And what is, the, what is the evolution going to look like even post pandemic from your perspective? So, yeah, there, there, again, there are a number of aspects to that that we have to consider. I mean, web conferencing is not new. We've only been using it as an add-on to our existing meetings, as an add-on to our normal interaction. Now, all of our interactions have to happen through a screen. 
And that's something that from a human perspective is really challenging to do. We're social animals. Whatever web conferencing application that you are living on, web conferencing fatigue is real. Um, it is something though that we have to get accustomed to because as you said, we're gonna be in this, this situation for some time to come uh, until we can start to navigate our way out of the virus crisis. Now, there are some methods that some are starting to take to address this. I've heard a number of examples. Um, one is CIOs that block off, their, block off one day a week. They have no video meetings. They're available via email. They're available even via phone, but not on video. And so that becomes kind of their separation. The other thing that I think is important here is we need to be very careful about work-life balance. And this is part of the challenge is how late do you work? How early do you work? For example, today I was up at 4.30 to start my calls because I was engaging with folks from Europe and I won't end until probably six o'clock tonight. That's a pretty long day of being on constant calls where I might have only had a half hour break here or half hour break there. So there's a lot of that that is starting to take place that we have to kind of navigate our way through and manage that work-life balance. Yeah, couldn't agree more with you. Um, I think we are all trapped right now in that same situation. And uh, I think it, it is all about privatization. And quite frankly, I have started to just carve out half days here and there. Otherwise, you, you just are on these webinars and, uh, and conference calls all the time. Yep. Um, there's another interesting, I think, um, initiative going on right now, which I picked up that um, IT organizations are trying to assess what does a hybrid world look like where, you know, I mean, certain companies say, well, you know, we will have some staff coming back into offices, but others might just be working from home. Um, and some of them might just come two or three days. And so for the IT organization on its own, I think it's, it's a new reality. And so do you see actually IT organizations considering to do everything remote from basically from their homes in the future? Absolutely. Um, and we've heard it publicly stated. Some companies are stating that they are gonna support work from home for their employee base, not just IT, but their employee base. Let's face it, this has been the great experiment. Um, you know, as much as this has been a challenge for all of us to kind of navigate through and figure out how we work, it has been a really great experiment to show that, hey, when we are pushed to, sh and we have to figure out how to work remotely, we can actually do pretty darn well working remotely. And many folks have found that they're actually more productive by working remotely. Now, I won't say that that's across the board, but I would say that the majority of folks do agree with that statement. There have been a number of CIOs that have also used this opportunity to say, you know what, we absolutely can work remotely. And coming out of this, we're not gonna bring our IT staff back in the office. Now. We have to balance this a bit because we have to respect the fact that there are different styles of how people work. Some people are actually more comfortable working from home. So others are not. Others are more comfortable working in a group setting and having that, that physical interaction with other people, even if it is just to see other people. Mm -hmm. And so there will be some folks that do come into the office, even if they're the standard work from home statement that gets made. But I think on the whole, we'll start to see more people working remotely. To that point, it'll also start to change both inclusivity as well as hiring and retention. Because as people start to look at, okay, what is the pool I can pull from? Think of the Bay Area, an incredibly, incredibly competitive market for IT professionals, right? Sure. You work there, I've worked there, I grew up there. And so you find that it's really hard to find talent and retain talent within the Bay Area. If you have this work from home culture, it doesn't matter where they live. And in fact, I had one CIO who mentioned to me that they're actually supporting someone who's working from another country who they were planning to relocate to the Bay Area. 
And then after all of this happened, they said, you know what? Stay where you are. You don't have to relocate here to the Bay Area. You can work from home. And so I think we'll see more of this starting to play out. There will be some equilibrium that we eventually get to, but I think the pendulum has definitely started to swing in the other direction. So what you're also saying is that uh, let's move, you know, the entire video of reality forward by, let's say, one and a half years, two years after we have had an, a vaccine and, you know, hopefully risks are less around uh, coronavirus spreading. Um, so you, you do envision that just our workplace, our work environment, it has changed forever. Absolutely. Um, I, have, uh, I have another, I read a blog just a few days ago, which was, you know, uh, a first for me to hear about it, which talked about that the CIO and the CMO have to work closer together than ever, because it is for every single company uh, in this digital world, it's about the user experience. And so, and especially now where we have a distributed environment of the workforce and we still have one brand, but this brand and the messaging and everything is literally, you know, digital. So what's, what's your take on, you know, CIO, CMO working together on uh, the CIO and CFO working together? That's another angle. I give you another angle, which is interesting because there is this notion that in the past, you know, cybersecurity has been seen as a tax by a lot of companies because, you know, nobody has hit us. So why do we have to protect ourselves? And uh, I think now where you basically go away from a centralized model into a distributed model, as you said earlier, the attack surface is much larger. So CIO, CMO, CIO, CFO, interesting you know uh connections and partnerships which have to work much better together than you know uh pre-pandemic yeah without a doubt i mean you absolutely as a cio you absolutely need to have a great relationship with not just your cmo but the rest of the executive team including the ceo and if you don't full stop start working on that and start working on that now the CMO relationship, I think, is particularly special in one way, in that if you look at the three things the CIO um, focuses on, and I talk about this as part of the what I call the turn-in concept, and I know, mm -hmm. Gunter, you and I have talked about this in, in past conversations, but there are three things that, that the transformational CIO really has to focus on. Number one is revenue growth. Now, revenue growth is an exhaust metric, let's be honest. It's an exhaust metric of the second item, which is customer experience and customer engagement. So if your customer engagement and experience is positive, of course, it'll impact revenue growth. If it's not, it'll impact revenue growth. But of course, revenue growth is a metric that the rest of the executive team and the board looks at. Customer engagement is incredibly important because at the end of the day, if you do not have good engagement with your customers and a good experience for your customers, they will go elsewhere. And then the third one is kind of brass tacks at this point for CIOs, which is operational efficiency or agility. And so you have to have that underfoot, but you have to have these other two pieces. So let me kind of use that as the stepping point to your question about the CMO. Customer engagement starts with the CMO. And so I think the CMO and the CIO have to come together because we no longer can just put people behind the problem. We have to leverage data. We have to leverage insights and we have to leverage technology. The market of one and personalization is no longer an option. It's a requirement. And if you're not there, you're not using technology, A, but you're going to have a hard time competing in today's marketplace. And so I think it's incredibly important that those two roles come together and align very clearly. Of course, the CFO role is one that you need to have a good relationship with but in a very different way. I mean, money management is always a key piece. IT sometimes can be all over the map. I have walked into situations where 
one year IT is spending X, the next year they're spending 2X, the next year they're spending half an X, and the year after that they're spending 3X. And the CFO is pulling their hair out going, what do I plan for? Where's, how, how, what, I don't know what to do. So you have to be thinking about operational uh, efficiency, not just in technology, but you have to have a degree of financial acuity. And financial management is something that that IT organizations aren't necessarily well prepared for, but it's something that they have to be thinking about because IT, or I'm sorry, financial acuity is something that ties directly into value. And value is what everyone's looking at. So having those two relationships are important. I will say there actually is a third that is probably more important than just those two. And that's the CIO CEO relationship. The CIO needs to think like the CEO of the company. And to be clear, I'm not talking about the CIO being the CEO of technology. That is a bum path that you should avoid at all costs. What I'm talking about is the CIO needs to think like the CEO of the company. The difference is the CIO has technology as their weapon of choice. And so Aligning with those business requirements, those business objectives that the board is looking at, that the C-suite is looking at, and then using technology as your weapon is a very, very powerful combination. Now, that's the upside. The other part to this, and something that you pointed out, is around risk. And so talk about work from home. We just expanded our, our cybersecurity footprint I don't know how many times because now we're, as I said earlier, now we are across a number of different networks and not networks that we manage, not networks that are protected. God only knows what the kids are downloading and have installed and are, are starting to, to play with and work with and what kind of traffic is coming across that network. I mean, there are so many different ways that this creates a real challenge for IT professionals and security professionals. And in the conversations that I'm party to, I will say this is a big concern around CISOs and CIOs is they're just waiting for the shoe to drop. They know that they had to go out there. They know they had to get people working from home and functional, but they also realized that came at a price and that price is yet to be paid. And so there is a concern around that. I think the sooner you kind of start to button that up and start to pull it together, the better off you'll be to be able to limit your risk profile, but there's only so much you can do too. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and so you mentioned something about, and and I hear it right now from some of the the customers and uh, and new prospects we are engaging with at A10 where, um, you know, the, the, a lot of the IT directors and CIOs are asked about, well, you know, do more with less. Figure out, and of course, last year I had met some of the CIOs, even internationally, and everybody was talking about automation, automation. We want to automate the underlying application and security infrastructure. And so now we, you know, some of the CIOs and IT directors are still dealing with that same pain point but are also asked because of, you know, a recession being going on in many parts of the world uh, to do more with less. So what is your take on how the CIO community right now is just dealing with this, that pain point of uh, less investments, but providing better protection and more automation? And particularly that falls then to AI because people think that, oh, AI is going to solve all my automation you know, pain points. So what's, yeah. what's your take on that? Yeah, so, th- so I need to set some, set some uh, context first. And AI, I'll just say it outright, AI is not the magic elixir. So it's not the, the magic pill that you take and solves everything. Unlike past economic downturns, like the 2008, 2009 downturn, the dot-com bust in, in 99 going into 2000, into 2001, and the, um, you know, each of these, these different upheavals in between, each of those have had financial ramifications, but they were driven by financial issues. Our current situation is not driven by a financial problem. Our current situation is driven specifically by 
uncertainty with the virus crisis. As soon as we get certainty around the virus crisis, once we get certainty around the virus crisis, that will then lead us into the economic crisis, which will then help us help guide us through the social impact. The reason why I lay this out first is because when you start to think about pulling back the purse strings and trying to figure out where you spend money and where automation fits in, you might be thinking about short term, how do I preserve cash, right? Cash preservation is a key aspect to any sort of economic turmoil. But automation can help you, it can also hurt you. And it's important to understand where to put it in the right places. So leveraging automation to help give you that flexibility to be able to cycle up and down as needed and kind of move back and forth as needed, because sometimes you might see a, a quick bump or spike and then all of a sudden you have to peel back again. You need that kind of flexibility. Machine learning, artificial intelligence are part of the keys to automation. But there's another piece to think about and why this context is really important. Once we get stability around the virus crisis, and then that leads to more stability around the economic crisis that we can start to drive out of, we're gonna need to be able to scale. And that scale should not come at the cost of humans. That scale should come at the cost of technology. And so automation gives you the ability to ramp very quickly if that's what your business is doing. Now is the opportunity to put these innovations in place while you have very little deal flow. Don't wait until you've got a full funnel of customers and a lot of risk on the table to be able to take these big chances. Now is the time to do it. Interesting, interesting. Um, fully, I'm fully on board with your strategy on that. For any CIO or anybody in the IT organizations who have to make decisions right now for the budget planning process, not just probably for the next six months, because there's still a lot of risk and uncertainty what's going to happen, right? Um, what are you basically just suggesting or recommending um, those stakeholders to do already for their budget set cycle for 2021? There are a couple things that you have to think about. And some of the things that I'm advising uh, organizations to look at are you have to look at the short game. No question, right? Cash preservation is paramount here. You have to think about your people because at the end of the day, as we start to come out of this, you're going to need people again. My advice is look at the short term, play the short term game, but do not ignore the long term game. The long-term game is where you're going to win it. You're going to survive going by playing the short-term game. You're not going to win it by playing the short-term game. You're going to survive by playing the short-term game. But think about where you go from here. And so put the pieces in place now that put you in a better position when you hit into 2021 and beyond. I was asked uh, by the Wall Street Journal um, just a couple of weeks ago how far out I thought we would be before we really kind of saw an uptick again. And the answer I gave was Q3 of 2021. Now, some kind of mocked me and said, well, wait a second, that is way out there. Nobody's thinking about that. Okay, well, people were thinking that this virus crisis was going to be a 30-day you know, vacation. Look yeah. what it's turning out to be. Again, go back to the fundamentals. What is causing all of this? The virus uncertainty is what's causing all of this. Until we get our arms around it, the rest of it is going to be hard to play. That is at least another six months plus out. Once we get past that, then we can start building our way out. And that's going to take at least two quarters to be able to do that. And that's why I'm saying Q3 of 2021. So there is a method to my madness, um, but I do think it's important for folks that are listening to this and, and viewing this to think about what is your short game and what is your long game and how do you play them both at the same time? Because you need to be in a position to be flexible and be able to, to move at a moment's notice. And that is what's going to define the winners and losers coming out of this. Tim? Um, you know, <clears throat> this is so un insightful, I think. And, um, um, you know, I'm, I'm fully on board with you. I, I share uh, your risk analysis. I share, you know, your strategy. 
that this uh, pandemic uh, will have to be taken seriously. And uh, particularly when it comes uh, to the IT strategies and investments, uh, short term, long term. And um, yeah, I'm not surprised that you are basically suggesting, you know, we need to uh, be thinking in, into Q3 2021. Um, with that, I really want to thank you for spending this time with us on the A10 TV podcast. It's such a pleasure to talk to you and uh, thanks so much. Thanks, Gunter. It's always a pleasure chatting with you and I look forward to our next conversation as well. 